Good morning. Good morning. Great. Glad to see you guys are awake. I'm barely awake myself at this time. Uh, one of the privileges of being an academic. Uh, uh, my name is Ravi Dar. I'm the faculty director of the Yale Center for Customer Insights. My pleasure to welcome you to Yale, to New Haven, and to this conference in particular. A lot of uh, some of the happy, smiling faces, I think, are the academics who just finished teaching. Uh, <laughs> They tell us they love teaching, but you see them smile a little extra after the classes are over. Um, really nice to see such an impressive turnout, as I said, so early in the morning. It's a testament to the fantastic uh, lineup of speakers we have. But even more than the speakers, I think it's really a testament to the themes of the conferences uh, over the years of what marketing, you know, how marketing itself is changing. And recently there was a survey done by the CMO Council that I was a part of looking at, so what are the big ideas on the in the minds of CMOs, and three really things came up, and all the three things you'll be hearing about today, how brands are built in a digital world, how to use data and technology to connect with consumers across the consumer journey and at scale, and obviously, finally, the emergence of new business models. The fourth thing that we, are, we might spend some time, given our first speaker is from Facebook, even though he's gonna talk about something very different, I'm sure there might be some questions around privacy, which is really the fourth big thing that came across in the survey that was done in the CMO Council. The conference is in its uh, 14th year now. This is the 14th such conference uh, we have held. How many of you have been to more than one of these uh, set up? Okay, so we do have a fair number of loyal repeat buyers uh, <laughs> who come in. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background, the Yale Center for Customer Insights, which many of you may not know, its center started around 15 years ago with the idea to bring academics and practitioners to work together. What keeps you up at night? Uh, what gets you up in the morning if you're, if you're a, a practitioner? And is there a research question? Yale Center works with the top 20 of the Fortune 100 companies, or I should say at least the top 20 of the Fortune 100 companies on addressing consumer challenges jointly. And one of the reasons we have this conference is to encourage academics outside Yale to make connections with the practitioners and perhaps get something started. We are very excited when that happens. So let me now turn to sort of introducing our opening keynote speaker. Will Platt Higgins is the Vice President of Global Client Relationships for Facebook. He leads a team of people across the world to partner with brand marketers and the agencies to use the Facebook platform to build, you know, high engagement, the brand potential that these, his partners or customers would have. Uh, I tried to doodle Will and get a little more uh, details on him. He's pretty good, nothing much came out other than your public speaking, so he's done a good job of limiting uh, the information on him. Prior to Facebook, Will led Procter & Gamble's multi-billion dollar global hair care and air care business at WPP's Gray Global Group. Will also worked as executive vice president at Saatchi & Saatchi in London and New York for 15 years with very well-known clients that I'm sure many of you are in the room. Uh, Coca-Cola, General Mills, Miller Tools, Delta Airlines, UBS, and of course, uh, Procter & Gamble. Delighted to have you here. Please join me in welcoming Will. Thank you, Robbie. Okay, good morning. Very good morning, everybody. Uh, it seems some things haven't changed in uh, education. Still nobody wants to sit in the front row. <laughs> it's just one of those truisms, isn't it? Um, okay, so, uh, Robbie, thank you very much for an introduction. I think we need to help you on your Googling. Uh, it, it, there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty about me that actually maybe I, I would prefer wasn't out there. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And again, a very, a very warm good morning. Um, so uh, where better to talk um, about unlearning than in a seat of learning uh, here at, at Yale? Um, and I wanted to um, maybe just to uh, suggest that um, as much as we are, as much as we've been um, successful and we all feel like we're on a learning curve, in fact, the learning curve that we're on can feel very overwhelming at times, uh, I wanted to, to suggest that actually uh, we're in a process of, of constant learning and, and unlearning and relearning, and it is that cycle, not a curve actually, but a, an infinite cycle that we're all on right now. And I, I wanted to also suggest that some of the things that we've learned that have allowed us to become so successful are actually some of the things that are in many ways holding us holding us back, and uh, I, I love, I'm a big fan of Clay Christensen. I, am I allowed to say that here at Yale? I think, good. Uh, a big fan of Clay Christensen, um, and this is a, a piece from The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, where Clay says, 
managers played the game the way it was supposed to be played. Managers were, were, had learned the rules and were following the rules. The very decision making and resource allocation processes that are key uh, to the success of established companies are in fact the very processes that reject the disruptive technologies. And I think another way to think about this is all of the things that we learn that allow us to be successful, that we codify in large organizations are, are sometimes the very things that prevent us unlearning and relearning new things. Uh, and maybe said more succinctly, uh, sometimes it is our very success um, that can be the problem holding us back. So, we are, after all, at an insights conference. Uh, so what I have done, um, which is uh, following the brief, Ravi, you'll be pleased to hear, is um, I've tried to um, put together five insights that hopefully will be, will be insightful for you um, around how um, specifically the mobile phone is disrupting um, businesses uh, and, uh, and ways to think about how we can start uh, understanding this learning this, maybe unlearning some of the things that we know and embracing some of these opportunities. So, uh, the first insight is gonna be around your competitive set and the fact that your competitors may in fact not look anything like you. Uh, the second is around exploration outside our orbit. I I'd be interested to um, hazard a guess at what the average age is in here. By the look of this handsome audience, I'd say maybe, what would you say, about 25, something like that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for laughing at that. Um, so to, I'm going to talk a little bit about exploring outside our orbit. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about mobile storytelling and some of the opportunities there, but also some of the, um, some of the challenges there. Uh, the, the, the clue in number four is with the, is with the, the line through there. The, the change, I think, that, that mobile has brought to shopping overall and then uh, the message that I think we... Um, that we all should start really understanding and embracing the message from messaging. So those are the, those are the five areas I wanted to, to get into. Um, and uh, at the end of this, I'm gonna open it up for any questions if you, if you guys have any. Maybe from, I'll start with the front row. Uh, so I'm just gonna, just gonna, because they're, 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 they will be the easier ones, I think. Um, all right. Okay. So let's, let's start with the first, uh, the first insight, which is that your competitor may, may not look uh, anything like you. And um, I'll begin with some of the well-worn, uh, in many ways, cliched examples of how software has been disrupting the world. Of course, this is Mark Andreessen's philosophy for a long time now, where um, uh, software has disrupted the hotel industry vis-a-vis -vis, um, Airbnb. We've had the music industry disrupted by, uh, by software, originally, of course, by Napster. Um, we've had... Um, all kinds of industries being disrupted by software. And the advent, of course, of e-commerce being an incredibly uh, disruptive transition for retail. Disruptive transition and, of course, a massive opportunity as well. And I wanted just to linger on this because um, this is, you know, SEA has been around uh, a long time, more than 100 years ago. And I, I would maybe submit to the, the audience gathered here today that Sears, Sears was the everything store. Uh, Sears was the A to Z of commerce. Um, the Sears Shopping Guide really, really truly was uh, the Bible of commerce, very well trusted and relied upon. Uh, Sears would, would ship you anything they were in the delivery business. In fact, they would, if you wanted to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sears would deliver you a horse. Um, so, you know, back then when that was a, definitely a job to be done. So what actually, um, what actually was happening there that prevented Sears from, from evolving to... Uh, to enjoy the, uh, the advent of successes that some of the e-tailers are having. And again, I would suggest that perhaps some of the things that were working for Sears were the very things that were, were actually holding them back. Now, these are the well-worn um, examples. Everybody's familiar with them. You probably have a lot of these applications on your phones and you're using them on a regular basis. But what about some of the other examples? Um, Facebook and Instagram, um, have about seven million businesses on the platform, the building their businesses. And I wanted to show, share an example here. This is uh, a business started by a young lady called um, Inspiralized. It's fairly self-explanatory what it is. You can spiralize your vegetables, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure many of you do this. Uh, I haven't got one yet. And um, th what, what, I've, what I've got here is, uh, is just an example of how um, she showed us how she built her business, which is actually just, um, creating ads using, in this case, it's the Boomerang application, but creating ads on her phone in her own apartment, uh, and then iterating. So trying, trying lots of, see if this builds here for me, trying lots of different examples uh, of how to do that and how to bring this, this benefit to life on a mobile phone and seeing how effective it is. And in a year, 
this lady was able to build a business uh, with one and a half million dollars in sales. And four years later, it's appreciably bigger. They have now distribution in Crate and Barrel. They're on the home shopping network, and it's really doing quite well. And this is one of multi-millions of examples that we have of, of I think, where if you're looking for competitors, they might not be in the place that you expect, you expect to find them. And that actually anybody now, anybody with a smartphone, a decent, a decent connection, and a great idea can become a disruptor, can be a competitor to your business. So um, we think a lot about this uh, at Facebook. And the lens through which we think about this um, is what we, what we, what we call uh, magnitude and momentum. Now, what do I mean by magnitude and momentum? OK. So uh, I'm sure on Monday mornings, many of you start your weeks looking at what's happening. right? How's our business doing? How are we doing vis-a-vis -vis our competitors? And we're no different than that. And here's a chart here, carefully blinded out, all axes blinded out so that you can't see exactly what's going on. But here's a chart where we look at the competitive set. And what happens when you look at a chart with a competitive set? Uh, is that you automatically look for the lines going up to the right and the larger players. And these are indeed competitors of magnitude. And these are the competitors that you would expect us to be looking at. So these might be um, WeChat, and these might be Line, and these might be Kakao, and Snap, and YouTube, and so on and so forth. And you could say, OK, these are the, these are the, the, the higher lines, the, line, the lines operating at larger volumes. Um, but we spend equal, if not more, time thinking about the competitors that are harder to discern at the bottom and really only become discernible when you magnify them. And these are the competitors of momentum. These are the competitors that are growing rapidly, maybe 100, 1,000 percent month over month growth off a very small base. And it's this kind of um, sort of peripheral vision that allows us to see trends, things that are happening in the marketplace, apps that are, that are doing very well. This might be a, a small uh, college, application, college application in Norway. This might be uh, a year or so ago. This might be Prisma. In 2010, 2011, this would have been Instagram popping up here. Um, right now, although it's already come to scale, this would allow you maybe a couple of years ago to look at things like Musical.ly and TikTok and so on. So we, I've been with the company about seven and a half, nearly eight years now. Um, and we're only a 15-year-old company. But the amount of reinvention that we've done in that, in that short period of time is, for me, um, it's been astonishing and, and breathtaking and sometimes incredibly painful. So just since 2011, there have been probably six or seven major pivots of the organization. The well-documented shift to mobile. Remember, the, the platform was born in 2004. It was born as a desktop platform, born on desktop. Um, Instagram, of course, was born on a mobile phone. Snapchat, born on a mobile phone. Facebook, born on desktop. The shift to mobile, our entire business was geared to desktop. Our engineers were geared to desktop. Our capability on mobile was HTML5. It wasn't app-based. That was a big transition. We made a transition in acquiring Instagram. Is that a massive cultural transition for the company? No, not necessarily, but nevertheless a major acquisition. Then we made a big transition to embrace virtual and augmented reality and get in in a scary way, I think, if you happen to be the CFO, get into the hardware business and acquire Oculus. And this is Mark's bet that the future of, of social networking will be around virtual reality in the way that we connect with, with one another. Then we made a pivot in the organization to messaging. We decoupled the Messenger app from the core app. We acquired WhatsApp. We saw that as a consumer trend, and we embraced that. We shifted then to become a video-first organization. Why? Because connectivity is tremendous. I got off the plane last week in Delhi uh, and enjoyed LTE as soon as I got off the plane. Uh, in large parts of this country, I'm already seeing the 5G thing pop up on my phone. So it's become much easier for us to both download and upload video and share video in a way that, of course, Facebook started as static posts and then videos, uh, then photos and now videos. Then we made a shift to stories. Why do we make a shift to stories? Because that's what consumers wanted. We missed that. That was, it was a format that was pioneered by Snap. And now we have more sharing to stories across our surfaces than feeds, which is a massive, massive wholesale, wholesale change in our organization. We're reinventing ourselves around stories, and we're currently in the process of reinventing ourselves around uh, privacy, encryption, groups, and various other things. So I just wanted to, to suggest that this notion of constant reinvention has for us just become a drumbeat of the normal. And, and Mark talks a lot about this. 
and he talks about leading a culture that encourages us to try things and test things and fail. On Friday, every afternoon on Friday, he does a Q&A. Very often, someone will put their hand up and say, what do you think about the fact that this particular thing has failed? And he'll say, I'm very disappointed about that. I wish it hadn't failed. Um, I wish that it had been more successful. I feel bad for the team. That they, that they've, they feel like they might have wasted some time and that they're disappointed. But I would, you know what would worry me more is if you weren't asking me about failures. That would worry me more because what I want to suggest is that in many ways, some of the successes that we've had have been really because of the failures and that failures are actually the fuel, nothing other than the fuel that you burn uh, towards your journey to success. Okay, that was the first insight I wanted to share. Now, my fellow audience of 25-year-olds, I wanted to talk about the second insight, which is around exploring outside our orbit, or as someone said to me the other day, you just don't get it, Will, right? So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, one of the challenges here. So uh, if you're turning 14 today, how is your reality? How has your reality changed? Well, maybe your, your mum, when she comes back from work, isn't bringing home a paper newspaper like you were used to. Uh, maybe you don't have a Rand McNally uh, atlas in the back of your car anymore. Uh, maybe you don't have a phone book in the kitchen that's propping up the kitchen door anymore. Um, You've probably never known at 14 video that doesn't start when you want it to start. Uh, you've never known a world without these large uh, global digital providers. The chances are that you've used a tablet, this says before five, I think for many young children now they're using a tablet before the ages of three. You've never known t TV content that actually doesn't have the ability to offer you either no ads or skippable or fast forwardable ads. The no your notion of taxis has already been disrupted at this age because you're disordering those from your telephone. I think, I think believe Uber's IPOing today. Um, and then it goes on, ladies and gentlemen. You might have ad-free access to a number of platforms. You might have Spotify ad-free. You might have pinched your, your parents' uh, Netflix logon, uh, and you're using that assiduously, uh, trying to uh, not be spotted. Perhaps you're not walking through the supermarket with your parents at the weekend in a way that you used to, and getting the brand imprints and the habits and practices that we all grew up with. You're probably following influencers and creators on various social platforms. You for sure are owning, uh, own a messaging device that we call a phone, um, and they're discovering their own brands that might be unknown to their parents. This is a reality, and this, this is a generation that is about 25% of the total population of the world. There's a very different world in which they're coming up in. And I wanted to just spend a moment on gaming, talking about gaming. I'm sure you'll be, uh, and many of you are enthusiastic gamers here, I I'm sure. So yes, the vast majority of Generation Z are gamers and spending a lot of time in gaming. Um, and you can see the, the shift here, maybe some of the PC stuff is going down, the console stuff's coming up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you might come to the same conclusion I did, which is, well, this is boys or men. This is, this is basically a, a guy-dominated thing. Nope, nope, 50% of gamers is, is female, is women and girls doing this. Um, and look at the size of this. So the worldwide audience is enormous. The worldwide audience for eSports and eGames is larger than all of our large US sporting franchises put together. Uh, this image here on the right-hand side, ladies and gentlemen, is Madison Square Garden, where you can spend your hard-owned money to go and watch people eGaming in a sold-out venue here. And let me, let me also uh, explain, and you may already know this, that uh, the IOC, the Olympic uh, Committee, has officially ratified e-games as an Olympic sport. I thought that was quite, quite unusual too. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and, but never mind, never fear, ladies and gentlemen, if you have enthusiastic gamers under your roof, because there is an increasing number of US colleges that are offering scholarships to e-sports, including the University of Michigan, the University of Texas, not, not Yale, perhaps yet. Um, <laughs> And in the university uh, in, in Arlington in Texas, there is, I believe, a $12 million stadium being built, this gentleman knows this, for eSports. So this is, this is not niche. This is not a young chap in your basement. This is a massive thing operating on platforms like Twitch at scale uh, all over the world. And so there's a lot of conversation about influencers and creators, and typically we tend to shorthand this in our minds. Influencers and creators are around in the beauty business. Uh, but in fact, um, gamers dominate influencing here. Um, the numbers sort of one, two, and three here are, are, are actually influences, uh, gaming influencers being followed by tens of millions of, uh, of, of people. 
and that celebrity, our notion of celebrity, and it's still the case, by the way, of course, that people can become celebrities through television, and they can become celebrities through sport, and they can become celebrities through music. That's a truism, and I don't think that's ever, ever going to change. But there is an awful lot of celebrities, celebrities, if you will, being created through these social channels. And that this is, again, operating at scale. And this is big business. So much as you might list here famous celebrities that we might be able to list down and, and guess that their incomes are, are multi-million dollar incomes, um, this is real business. And what, what, what struck me and, and continues to strike me um, is the bottom one here, which is Ryan, Ryan Toys Review, which is a YouTube channel um, enjoying a cool 20 plus million in, in, in revenues on an annual basis, which is a seven-year-old boy with his family unwrapping toys and telling you about that. Why didn't you get into that business? Why didn't I get into that business? Why am I not seven? So, uh, so a lot of time is being spent on these surfaces. Uh, a huge amount of video is being created and, and consumed on these surfaces. We know, we know all of this. And I think one of the, one of the provocations when, when people say to me, you just, you just don't get it, which is, and I would admit, I just don't get it. One of the provocations is that as marketers and advertisers, one of the great things about what we do, what we do is we create things. And it's sometimes incredibly gratifying to continue to challenge ourselves as marketers and, and, and advertisers and creators. And, and professionals to, to step outside of our familiar and get familiar with some of these, um, some of these new trends. OK, number, number three. Um, number three, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about mobile storytelling. Now, um, one, of the, one of the good pieces of news here, there's lots of good news here this morning. One of the good pieces of news here is that in many ways, nothing's changed. In many ways, nothing's changed. This is, this is a, a 99. <laughs> Yeah, I like this too. I'm glad you like this. Uh, this, is, this is supposedly the world's first selfie. Uh, this, is, this is 99 years old, uh, and self-portraits continue, uh, continue to reign in importance for us in society. So nothing's really changed there. Uh, the, this, the advent of putting on the, the, the front camera did, did of course, um, scale this, this insight. And then what about the concern that... Um, Nobody's paying attention to anyone anymore, and you get on a train or a plane, and people are immersed in their phones. Well, this is a photograph um, from uh, a newspaper article published about 60 years ago, essentially saying the same thing, decrying the fact that people are not socializing on trains, and why aren't people talking to one another? And actually, when I started commuting, which was around 1991, I think it was, um, in England, there's I bought a newspaper at the train. I got on board the train. I opened it up, as did everybody else. And this is a very familiar seen for me. So in many, ways, in many ways, nothing has changed other than the technology. But what I do want to suggest when it comes to building creativity for the mobile cameras, I do want to suggest that things are a little bit different and that what you have here is, I think, a need for us as marketers to simplify, simplify, simplify things down. And television, which is, is an extremely effective format, um, is an I'm simplifying here myself, but is typically creatively one format that you can build for of different lengths. And that mobile is a, is a series of multiple formats, and that we need to understand this and we need to embrace this. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, growing up watching film, movies, and so on, the aspect ratio, nothing better than coming to be theater and seeing a big wide screen. And the aspect ratio is stretched and horizontal and works really well and immerses us on that. But storytelling on mobile has become vertical. And, and they're highly, highly popular. So, OK. Vertical, I got that word. So, OK. Got it. Vertical video. It's trending. It's, it's, it certainly seems uh, very popular. So it's that simple, right? Well, think about it. You get on an airplane. You get on a bus. People come on with their phones oriented like this. They're tapping away. They're doing whatever they need to do. And then they sit down. And when they sit down, they flip it. And it becomes horizontal. And if you walk, walk backwards on an airplane to go to the loo these days, this is what you see, right? Often on tablets, sometimes on phones, but this is what you see. So, ah, OK. So it's vertical and it's horizontal. OK, I got that. Um, but it's also interactive. So we grew up uh, eating breakfast and often getting our uh, games and fun and insight and coupons and so on, staring at the back of the cereal packet. That's certainly, certainly what I did as a, as a young boy. Um, 
but now the mobile phone gives you an opportunity to take that cereal packet in this instance and bring it to life to actually augment the reality of you sitting at the kitchen table and bring the experience to life. So, okay, it's vertical and it's horizontal and it's interactive, um, but it's also a series of other things that maybe are hard for me to even crystallize on one slide. So it creates um, cultural water cooler moments. Some of these things are created by individuals. Some of these things are created by professionals and some somewhere in, in the middle, Bill Gates. Uh, <clears throat> and you have things like um, Lady Gaga, which is the most watched, um, Lady, Lady Gaga's Super Bowl halftime, which is the wa most watched um, event of, of any one time. And so how do you classify these? Some are vertical, some are horizontal, some are consumer created, some are professionally created, and so on. Uh, the ecosystem of the mobile um, is, a, is a complicated thing based on the job to be done that the consumer is, is, is using uh, the, the mobile for. And so while, while it might be unfair to characterize the creative assets of television as one thing, it might, it might be unfair to do that, I certainly would suggest that m building creativity for mobile isn't one thing, it's a series of things. And we sometimes see, we often see a desire to simplify it down. It's, I just want one thing for my toolkit. It isn't one thing. And I would encourage us to embrace the complexity. Okay, um, the fourth insight uh, that I wanted to share with you is around shopping. And as I said, the clue here is in the title. We're just shoppers. And the artificial construct, I think, of on and offline, the mobile phone has, has uh, dissipated. And it's something that, again, I think I encourage us to kind of unlearn in a way. So you could argue that we've, we've gone from this notion of, oh, I'm physically going shopping. Would you like to go shopping with me this Saturday? I'm going shopping to actually, I'm just always shopping. Now, I know none of us like to be characterized as always shopping, but in truth, when you think about your behavior, you probably are, always are in a shopping mindset. And so why, why has this happened? Well, you know, it's perfectly natural and perfectly logical. You have uh, the digital channels growing up after the traditional channels, and we built separate teams, and we kept them on one side. And I love, I love this title. It's the official marketing department is off on the right-hand side. In the red, you're the official guys. You make TV stuff and really important things like that. And over here, you're the separate marketing department. And increasingly, of course, what we're seeing is these things coming together. But that's what's happened here. And this is why uh, you have these separate divisions of, I'm in the shopper team. OK, that's good. And I'm in the consumer team. OK, are those in any way related? Let's not get into that. We're in separate teams. And so we've been thinking about this through, through the lens of separate channels. And, and I want to, to suggest that really, Mobile is the new shopping, mobile is the new window shopping, but it's also purchasing in one screen. So to give an example here, if I'm in Sephora, um, you know, I have an opportunity when I'm in Sephora to walk around, I can discover brands, I can explore, I can engage, and of course I can, I can purchase, I can buy. I can also do that now through my mobile device. You can see here, I can discover, I can explore, I can engage, and I can have um, a, a very good, simple, hardworking print ad enabled through, uh, through the mobile device and technology where machine learning can actually take that, that benefit. It can serve it to a cohort audience of people who are most receptive to it, allow them to interact with it, choose through styles, and convert in, in, in all in one action. And then similarly here, through augmented reality, you can take a hardworking piece of out-of-home, simple piece of out-of-home, and you can enhance that. And you can say, okay, those sunglasses look, look pretty good. Let me augment my reality by trying them on. Let me try them on. Let me try them on different colors. Let me take a screenshot of that. Let me WhatsApp that to a friend of mine and see what, what, I should, what they think about it. And then I can convert and I can buy. And then similarly, I, this one always interests me because um, you know, buying furniture on the internet feels like quite a hard thing to do. But actually, again, through technology, it's become, some of those barriers have become broken down and it's become a little bit easier for us to do that because I can just simply use my phone to scan my room. And then I can drop down the product that I'm looking at into my room and orient it, play around by the way if you, if you can or maybe, maybe have with the IKEA one. It's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. So you're able to use technology to enhance that experience and, di and, and dissipate some of the friction. So, uh, you know, it's a super powerful kind of workhorse, mobile, in terms of operating as one channel and able to do and tick a lot of these, a lot of these boxes here and, uh, and accomplish a lot of the jobs to be done that we as marketers and advertisers have. 
So my, my, my insight here is that <clears throat> just because I walk into a store, that makes me a shopper in the traditional construct. But as soon as I walk out of the store, I'm not a shopper anymore, I'm a consumer. And I think that the mobile phone has collapsed that, such that the shopper is a consumer and the consumer is a shopper. OK, <clears throat> I think I'm doing OK on time here. <clears throat> the last insight that I wanted to offer for you. This is around messaging. So we know that, we know that messaging is growing, blah, 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 Will, yes, lots of people using messaging apps. And, and actually, uh, the volume of messaging that we're doing now <clears throat> as a population is now orders of magnitude larger than peak SMS. We grew up with text messaging, love text messaging, still love te text messaging. But the volume of mess messages being sent <clears throat> is enormous. And for the vast majority of the world who skipped the desktop and the, and the laptop, they've of course gone straight to mobile. And for them, the most popular use case on the phone is the messaging application. So OK, great, interesting. I sort of knew that anyway. I want to suggest two things. One is that messaging is the new customer service. People now are not necessarily interested in looking on a product here for an 800 number. They are um, probably a little bit more enthused to send an email, although frustrated about where that might have gone and whether someone received it and is someone actually going to reply to me. They're almost certainly not going to get out an envelope and put a stamp on it and send that off. And so messaging as a customer service use case is really, has really become a big deal. Probably more developed outside, actually, of the US than in the US. And so what do I mean by this? I'll just focus here on a Lego example, because I think it's a, it's a super example of, of uh, an organization focusing on a, on a job to be done and building messaging protocol that helps there. Uh, it, one of the challenges that Lego have identified is there are thousands of SKUs. If you go through Lego on, on Amazon, it's overwhelming. But yet, I have a job to be done. I need to buy a gift of Lego for my eight-year-old daughter. And I have $30 to do that. Where do I even begin? Well, that's what the Lego messaging bot is. You're able to type in your target audience. You type in the age of the person you're looking for. And it narrows that down for you and offers you uh, an array of those. And then you can transact straight through the application. And there are countless other examples. And I do want to suggest that people just are now defaulting to your messaging presence. And they're expecting you to be there. And they're expecting you to reply quickly. And the fact that you're closed between kind of 7 PM and 9 AM in the morning is actually just that, that, that literally, like, pfft, why would you do that? Because again, the consumer is always shopping. So that's one, that's one piece, and I, and I know you guys, I'm sure you guys all know this, but I wanted to talk about something else, which is, gains a lot of traction outside of the US, particularly in Southeast Asia, and this is about social commerce, uh, or conversational commerce, where there is a tremendous amount of value being created for consumers and businesses. And what do I mean by that? Well. I'm talking about a large number of people in these countries who actually have uh, low credit card penetration. They're spending a ton of time on chat, as I say. Um, and it's actually a bargaining, much more of a developed bargaining culture than, than we have here, where if it's the price tag, we pay the price tag. Um, and the value for businesses here is I can meet people where they are. The messaging apps, the beauty brand in Indonesia, and it's called Ertos, E-R-T-O-S. So just to quickly run through this, they're building awareness of, of, their, of their brands. I believe in this instance, this is a mascara. They're building aware, awareness of, of Ertos mascara in feed. But the action that they want you to take is not buy now at the bottom or learn more. They want to drive you into messaging channels. So now I go into a messaging channel, and you can help me find the right mascara for me within that messaging channel. And we can go back and forth on that. I can send you a picture of my skin tone, et cetera, et cetera. Then I want to convert, and I want to buy. And because of the low credit card penetration, things are transacted on cash on delivery. So how do I know that you have cash? No problem. I just send a picture of my ATM receipt. So there's my ATM receipt. Cash is ready. I'm ready for you when you are. Then it gets delivered. How do I know it got delivered safely? How do I know you received it? No problem. Just take a picture. I got it. Right? And then we have retargeting because now I can follow up uh, and, and ask you how it was, whether you might be interested in other things through that messaging thread there. And uh, this is a, an Indonesian example. Spent some time in Thailand last year. And we went to visit one of these, one of these small beauty companies. And I want to just play you here um, an example of what social commerce sounds like if you're on the end of it trying to manage it. So how do you manage that? Well. You just build a different call center, a re-articulated call center. So this is, this is the HQ. This is the nerve center of the operation. You have about 15 or 16 
uh, people here whose job it is, and I will tell you, a very successful, well-compensated job is to manage these inquiries on social commerce about whether or not things are the right size, whether or not they're in the right color, did you get it, cash on delivery and all the rest of it. And that's, and that's, what's, uh, that's what's happening in social commerce and I think is going to start to become um, a much more prevalent use case for us as in, in business around the world. And so in conclusion on this piece, I just, it's just the point that messaging is just, it's just another channel, but it is transforming the relationships that we have between businesses and what we expect of businesses. So. Uh, in conclusion, we talked a little bit about the com your competitor may not look anything like you and that anyone with a mobile phone and a good idea can be your competitor. We talked about challenging ourselves a little bit to get outside of our orbit or to maybe think that maybe I don't get it, which is what I'm reminded of on a regular basis. Um, to think about mobile storytelling and to embrace some of the complexities within mobile storytelling. To think about how mobile has collapsed the shopping journey, uh, and to think about some of the implications for our organizations around messaging and how we can win in customer service and loyalty in that way. And I'll, I'll leave you here with, I um, hope I'm allowed to use another university quote here. Yeah, Ravi says, okay, fine. He rolled his eyes a little bit. Um, Love challenges, be intrigued by mistakes, uh, enjoy effort, and keep on learning. Keep on learning and challenging ourselves because I think the, the future will continue to belong to the curious. So thank you very much, guys. And I want to turn it to questions. if there are any. So, loved your talk. Thank you. And I'm as close to the front row as I could possibly Yeah, I, no, I appreciate that. You should get <laughs> extra points for that. I also appreciate that we're all 25 here. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about this as um, how do you, this obviously is very clear in terms of the implications for businesses that sell to consumers, but what are the implications for businesses that sell to businesses? Because I think a lot of these models are going to start transitioning in that way as well. Yeah. Well, what, 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 what have you learned so far in that, in that space from business to business? What have, you, what have you learned about some of the challenges there? Obviously, the world is more electronic than, than ever before. In the 16 years I've been in business, you know, we've watched our website become something that was kind of like a placeholder to something that can really drive traffic and, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, as a, as a professional services business, you know, we get a lot of queries still coming in, you know, by email and by phone, which are the traditional modes of communication. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a great question. I think I, what I would say is that <clears throat> maybe, maybe the parallel I would draw is that I talked a little bit about the artificial delineation between the shopper and the buyer. And I wonder whether we have the same construct here, which is we make an artificial construct between Will becomes a different person when he walks into his job in a B2B than he is from when he's just a B2C person. And, and actually, would a lot of people just prefer to interact with businesses just like they do with people? And I would submit the answer is yes. Um, one of, the, one of the areas that, we, that we've explored a while ago was, was workplace, which is basically Facebook for, for companies. And one of the reasons that that's been relatively successful is because it simply capitalizes on the existing human behavior of, hey, I broadly know how these social networks work. They're instantaneous. They're, they're a fairly seamless way for, for me to share information. And through, from a management lens, it allows me to understand the biggest frustration I have, and this is, of course, the, the well-known Nestle quote, which is, if only Nestle knew what Nestle knows, this might, be, this might allow us to actually get at that. So I, I, my supposition is that it should be probably no different from what us as consumers' expectations are, and that if I get in and all of a sudden I find myself printing long things out and putting them in, in envelopes, that's probably a, a, a behavior ripe for disruption as well. We can take one more. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm, the, the example, the last example you provided, I'm wondering if you think that the human-to-human -human interaction uh, 
on these messaging sites is really core to their success, these companies' successes, or if there's, or if you've seen successes, you know, companies being successful automating those responses. Like I know of a company that's doing just that, but I know that they're automating it, and so it yeah. feels less authentic. And I think the authenticity piece is really key. So can you speak to that a bit? I, I'm, it's a brilliant question. Thank you for asking me that. Um, if if you'd come around my side of the stage here, you'd see that that point was in my speaker notes, which I failed to mention. So. You're right. One, one of the things, if you talk to people about why they like this, um, they'll tell you that, that it, it's they're like, I would prefer to do this than go in a shop. Why? Because when I go in a shop, I have to try and attract someone's attention if there's somebody there at all, and they're disrupted trying to serve other people. Whereas I actually feel I get customized, personalized attention better sitting on my phone at home than I do from walking into the store. So definitely. Definitely, it is the personalized, tailored, tailored service that people feel they get, which is highly attractive. Um, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a job to be done or a use case for, for machine-learned uh, responses. So if I just simply want to know, hey, I love uh, Yale University's natural spring water, but I can't find it, right? then that's something that we can automate and say it's available at the following retailers you know, close to you. So I, I do think that there's a role for both, but I definitely think the magic in some of this social commerce and why it's taking off is definitely that personalized piece.